My name is Brenda, and welcome to Horrifying History, where you will hear about the unexplained, paranormal, and supernatural happenings that have stained the pages of history. Where I live is full of history, and according to some, it's full of ghosts, ghouls with a little sprinkling of poltergeists. Today, I thought I would tell you some tales from where I live that will creep out the bravest of us. Welcome to Episode 78, The Spooktacular Ghosts Near Me. In Season 1, I told all of you that I was planning to start a show called Horrifying History Live, where I plan to take you to see some of the spooky places that I travel to. Then came COVID, and that plan went on the shelf. I thought it wouldn't sit there very long, but here we are, months later. I'm not saying it's never going to happen, but for now, it's still on the shelf. But that isn't going to stop me from telling you guys the spooky tales about all the supernatural things that are said to be around me. Now, the first tale is a legendary Canadian ghost story. These events happened over 200 years ago, and this tale still sends chills down people's spines today. It has everything that a person wants in a spooky story. Lives being threatened, unexplainable forces, and an ending that leaves more questions than answers. Now, this tale starts at a place that is called the Baldoon Settlement, which is located near a town called Wallaceburg in southern Ontario in Canada. This settlement was the idea of a man named Thomas Douglas, who was the fifth Earl of Selkirk. Now, Thomas, he decided to provide an opportunity for poor farmers and peasants from his area in Scotland to come to Canada and build a better life for themselves. He specifically chose the Baldoon settlement area since it mirrored the Scottish Highlands. He persuaded at least 15 families to undertake this adventure, and he gave them further help by importing sheep for them to care for. These families were very excited for their new future, and on September 5th, 1804, they arrived at their new home to discover it was a piece of swampland. Now, to make things even better, it was also malaria season. Now, this settlement had it pretty rough from the very beginning. The swamplands were difficult to farm, and the amount they were able to produce was very, very low. Due to the poor quality ground feed, the sheep were not thriving. Then came disease that routinely swept through the settlement. The superintendent of this settlement tried to make things better. He used Thomas's money to try to solve some of these problems without any success. Then came the War of 1812, and the Americans invaded the colony. This is when most of the original settlers had enough, and they decided to leave. Now, Thomas at this time, he also threw in the towel and sold the land. Even with all this, some of the original settlers decided to stay and try to make it work. Soon, others decided to join them to try to make their fortune, and one of these was a man named John MacDonald who brought his family. They were very aware that life was going to be hard, but I'm pretty sure they had no idea what was coming next. Now, things started to go pretty bad for the MacDonald family in 1829. One day, some of the females in the family were in the barn spreading out straw. Without any warning, the poles which made the roof structure started to fall to the ground. The ladies ran for cover, and soon afterwards, the men of the family went out to try to figure out what happened. They quickly became perplexed. You see, the poles were installed in a way that they could not be loosened very easily. They started to wonder, could an unseen force have loosened them with the intent to cause them harm? Then came the unexplained noises that the family would hear day and night. When the family was asleep, they would wake up to hear footsteps throughout their house, but most came from the kitchen. But these were not just regular footsteps. According to the family, it sounded like the marching sound of many individuals marching off to war. When the family would look for the source of the noise, it would immediately stop. Another incident that thoroughly spooked the family was when one day the baby of the family was sitting up in their cradle. All of a sudden, the cradle started rocking violently side to side all on its own. Three men ran over and they grabbed the cradle to stop its movement, but even though they tried with all their strength, the unseen hands kept rocking that cradle and it was too strong for the three of them. When the men backed away in terror, the unseen hands continued to rock the cradle. Then came the fires. 
fires would just randomly start throughout the property. It was like a supernatural entity was trying to burn down the homestead. On one day, over a dozen fires started without any clear ignition source. As soon as one fire would be put out, another would start in another location. It was here that the family came to believe that someone or something was trying to drive them off of their property. Even though there were many types of disturbing events that occurred over the years, there were some things that would happen regularly, like rocks and bullets hitting the exterior of the house. After an attack, the family would go and collect these rocks and bullets and then leave a unique mark on them to allow them to be identified. They would take these items off of their property to dispose of them. They would dump them in various locations, including local waterways. A short time later, the same marked bullets and rocks would once again barrage their home, causing damage and breaking their windows. Now, after replacing the windows multiple times, John McDonald decided to board them up. But this didn't stop the attacks, and even though the bullets and rocks would be continuously collected and disposed of almost daily, nobody could explain how the same rocks and bullets would appear time and time again. Soon, the news of what was happening to the McDonald family spread throughout their community and then across the country. People in the community would tell stories of what they heard was happening, and newspapers quickly picked up the story. A short time later, this quiet community was overrun by visitors and the press who wanted to have their own supernatural experience. The locals and the McDonald family continued to record and report their experiences as they happened, and interest grew even further. Soon, newspapers started telling stories of the family's experiences as they occurred, and the press promoted this farm as a paranormal tourist attraction. Originally, the family welcomed the intention, but it soon changed when the attacks became more and more violent. The family became terrified, and they decided that this newfound fame was just not worth it. Thinking that the entity on the farm was connected to the house or land, the family decided to move to John's father's homestead that was located nearby. But as you spooky historians know, this activity sounds like poltergeist activity, and poltergeists are attached to a person and not an area. As soon as the family moved, the attacks started at their new location. Rocks and bullets immediately started hitting John's father's home and shattered his windows. The family decided to return back to their property but decided to stay in tents until the activity calmed down. Soon after this, the McDonald's reached out for help. They spoke to a local priest who had experience in performing exorcisms. After the priest came to the property and attempted to cleanse it, the activity worsened. This is when the McDonald family heard about a woman who was said to have the second sight. They traveled to her to try to get some insight on what was happening to them. Now this woman told the family that the reason these events are happening to them was that there was a curse placed on their property by an old woman. Now ironically, the McDonald's had a minor disagreement with an older woman and her sons when they originally purchased the property in the early 1820s. The family wondered, could it be that she was the one responsible for all of what was happening to them? Now this is where this tale diverges. Some of the folklore about this event says that the McDonald family decided to perform a ritual that would rid themselves of all the poltergeist activity, while other tellings say that the seer told the family that they needed to do something different. They had to shoot a black goose with a silver bullet since the woman used witchcraft on that bird and it was the source of all the activity. In the second telling, the McDonald shot the goose in its wing, and shortly afterwards, the family saw the old woman with her arm in a sling. Either way, it is said after the McDonald's took action, this is when the attacks ended. If the attacks ended abruptly, or if they dissipated over time, we're not sure. But the talk of the strange events that happened at Baldoon quieted it in the 1830s. The farm, it stopped being a paranormal tourist attraction and the family was finally able to live in peace. What happened at the McDonald farm remains one of Canada's best documented unsolved supernatural mysteries. Now looking at it one way, the newspapers at the time intentionally was sparse on the details and told people to go see it for themselves. This led to a lot of the lore being muddied in with truth. But most historians look to be what is considered to be the main source of this tale, and that would be Neil MacDonald, who was John's son. 
He was five years old when the event started, and he documented his and his family's experiences in a book that he wrote, which he called The Baldoon Mystery. But even if you discount all the sensationalized reporting that occurred during the time, it's still clear that something unexplainable happened in Baldoon. There are just too many witnesses and documented accounts to simply discount this tale as somebody's imagination. Most Canadians know that Sir John A. Macdonald was the first Prime Minister of Canada. He took office in 1867 and he died while still in office on June 6, 1891. He was a very colourful character who was known for two things. Firstly, he was such a procrastinator that he earned the nickname of Old Tomorrow and secondly, he loved spirits, the liquid ones. After Macdonald died, he was succeeded by Sir John S. Thompson, who only served as Prime Minister for two years. He also died while still in office, but Thompson didn't end his days in a hospital like Macdonald did. Thompson died unexpectedly while he was on official tour at Windsor Castle and he was having lunch with Queen Victoria. But while alive, he told confidants that he did not manage the country on his own. He believed that Old Tomorrow tried to communicate his views on private matters and on affairs of state that was told to him through a young man. Now, the one thing about Thompson was that he didn't enjoy public speaking, but when he spoke, his words were few and thoughtful. He considered himself to be more of a listener than a speaker, but when it came time for him to speak, he was always ready. Now, this was very noticeable when he was in Parliament. When parliamentary debates would happen between parties, Thompson would often just speak up when the matter went too far or it threatened the dignity of Parliament. It was here that he would speak up, giving a few words that would make peace between the arguing parties. He did the same when he was involved in the debate. It was because of this impartial attitude that he was recognized and favoured by all members of Parliament. Now, this man was the same in his personal life than he was in his work life a man of few words. And that is why many were surprised that a few months before his death, he spoke to a writer in length about experiences that he had with a person that his office would never speak of. Thompson was with his family and some friends who started talking about hypnotism, clairvoyance, and the meaning of dreams. Now Thompson decided to speak up and tell the group that these things were nothing to play with. This is when he told them his tale. Now, about a year after Thompson became Prime Minister, his private secretary came into his office saying that a young man wanted to see him. The man would not give his name, nor would he tell the secretary what he wanted to speak to Thompson about. But since the man appeared to him to be respectable and well-mannered, Thompson invited him in. When the two men were alone, Thompson asked the young man what he wanted. The man replied that he had a message for him from Sir John A. Macdonald, who died just before Thompson took office. Now, Thompson said he looked the man up and down and saw nothing to indicate that this man was trying to pull a joke. He asked what the message was and how did he receive it. The young man replied that Sir John A. Macdonald appeared before him multiple times and he was urging him to bring this message to Thompson. The young man said that the former Prime Minister exerted so much influence on him that he felt compelled to unburden himself of this message and to comply with his wishes. The message was related to money that belonged to Macdonald's daughter, Mary. Macdonald wanted that money to be transferred and reinvested for his daughter. Now, Thompson was skeptical. So after the young man left, he started to make inquiries about the man. He found out that the young man came from Nova Scotia to do some temporary work in the buildings around Ottawa. The man was part of a respectable family and had a very good reputation. After hearing this, Thompson decided to reach out to the lawyer who was entrusted in taking care of Mary's investments. The lawyer confessed that there were problems with Mary's investments and he was at a total loss on how this young man could have had this information since the lawyer told no one. The lawyer agreed that Mary's money should be transferred and reinvested just as the ghostly McDonald said, and that the ghost actually gave some really good investment advice. So as some time passed, the memory of this event just slid to the back of Thompson's mind. 
Then a few months later, the young man once again appeared at his office. He told Thompson's secretary that he had a message for him from the same source, but this time it was for Thompson himself. The man was ushered into Thompson's office, and he told Thompson that MacDonald was demanding that Thompson needed to make some changes in his cabinet. After questioning the young man, Thompson detected no deception, and then asked why did he think that MacDonald kept on appearing to him? Well, the man replied that he had absolutely no idea, but when MacDonald would start to appear, this man, or ghost, was relentless. MacDonald would appear nightly and repeat his demands until this young man would fill them. This made Thompson laugh, since he knew this was exactly how MacDonald acted while he was alive. When MacDonald had something on his mind, there was no peace until he got it. The changes that MacDonald were wanting were actually the changes that Thompson was thinking of, but after getting the ghostly advice, he took action. Thompson told the group that he didn't mind getting advice from his dead friend, but what he didn't know was that very soon he would be with him. Our next tale is definitely one of the more colorful stories of Ontario folklore. The legend of the Witch of Plum Hollow revolves around a woman who lived in Leeds County who was known as Mother Barnes. The tale of the woman named Jane Elizabeth Barnes, who went by Elizabeth, starts back in Cork, Ireland, where she was born in either 1794 or 1800. She was the seventh daughter of a seventh daughter, and she was a clairvoyant, soothsayer, and a water dowser. Elizabeth came from a very wealthy family. Her father was an Irish landowner of British descent and a colonel in the British Army. Her mother was also born in Ireland, but she was descended from Spanish gypsies. When Elizabeth was a young lady, her father arranged for her to marry a military colonel and a friend of his who was twice as old as his daughter. But the problem was that Elizabeth had already fallen in love. His name was Joseph Harrison, who was a military sergeant. Elizabeth knew that her parents would not want her to marry who she wanted to and to marry somebody who was beneath her station. So as her parents planned her wedding day, Elizabeth and Joseph decided to act. Joseph came to Elizabeth's house late one night and the young couple snuck out, eloped, and then left to go to what was then called Upper Canada. When her parents found out what Elizabeth did, they disowned her. But you know what? Elizabeth just didn't care. She was with her beloved, and soon the couple were blessed with a son who they named Robert. And then tragedy struck. Joseph died, and now Elizabeth was a 27-year-old widow raising her son alone. After four years of mourning her loss, Elizabeth married for the second time to a man who was named David Barnes. David was from Connecticut in the United States, and he was a shoemaker. Together, they had nine children six sons and three daughters. Two of their sons did not survive to adulthood. Now in the fall of 1843, the couple decided to make a change. They moved to an area called Sheldon's Corners that is near the town of Athens, Ontario. It was here that David started farming and that Elizabeth's gifts were starting to be known through the community. It was shortly after their arrival that the use of her gifts was first documented and this affected what her neighbors thought of her. It is said that some in the area were very fearful of her talents, while most embraced them. It was also here that she earned her nickname a Mother Barnes and the Witch a Plum Hollow. Now, many of you guys are likely thinking that neither of these nicknames were very respectful, but in actuality, they were. Historically, the term of witch was used for healers. The term of mother was not just used to describe a parent. It was also used to describe a wise woman or a folk healer. It was during this time that Elizabeth and David increased their family and they had the seven other children, but soon David just got sick of his farming life. He decided to move on and he took his youngest son and moved to nearby Smith Falls. They decided to stay with one of David's older sons and his family, so now Elizabeth and the rest of her children were alone. She was in dire straits and she needed money to support her large family. This is when Elizabeth got into the fortune telling business. She would read people's tea leaves and charge her clients 25 cents each, which was a big amount of money at that time. Very quickly, her reputation as a clairvoyant spread and people from all over Canada and the northern United States would travel to see her. 
Soon, Elizabeth was internationally known, and neighbors would see a constant stream of wagons and carriages going to Elizabeth's house. All of them would come to her house to see an older woman, wearing a shawl, sitting at her table ready to read their tea leaves. Now, not all of these people came to hear their futures. One time, she was asked to find a man who was missing. His name was Morgan Doxtater, but Elizabeth said she not only knew where his deceased body lay, but she knew who murdered him. It was his cousin, Edgar Harder, and Edgar soon confessed after the body was found exactly where Elizabeth said it was. Edgar was hanged for his crime. Now another time, a man who lost several sheep went to Elizabeth asking where he could find them. Elizabeth said his sheep were dead. She said the meat was located in barrels in his neighbor's cellar and their hides were hanging on the walls of that same neighbor's stable. When the man went to investigate, he soon discovered Elizabeth was right again. Now soon after this event, a young woman who was about to be married went to Elizabeth to find out what was going to happen in her future. She was told that she would marry the man she planned to and the couple would have children together. They would move into a house that was right beside a railroad track, and it was during this time that one of her children would be killed. After this woman married, her and her husband did live right beside a railroad track. This caused this woman great fear after her children were born. She was positive that one of her kids would be killed by a train. Then one day, one of her children did die. The youngest one was killed after being kicked by a horse in their yard. Now, the thing to note here is, Elizabeth never said the child was going to be killed by a train. No, no. She said the child was going to die when they lived in a house by the railroad tracks. So now Elizabeth's talents help people financially too. One time, a man named Dr. Jackson came to her to ask her to help him find a missing deed. Elizabeth told him that the deed was tied with a blue satin ribbon and was hidden inside a white satin slipper in the home of a relative, who she also gave the name of. While Dr. Jackson searched this home, he found the slipper and the deed. In another incident, a man came to Elizabeth to find out where one of his missing horses went. Now she told him that this horse was in one of his fields that actually was horrible land to have animals graze on. But the thing was, that land was extremely valuable. A few years later, when this man sold his farm, he was very upset to find out that the new owner opened up a gravel pit in the same field, making him a fortune. Now, one of the most famous people to go visit Elizabeth was a person we spoke about today, Sir John A. MacDonald. At the time that MacDonald went to see Elizabeth, he was a lawyer from nearby Kingston, Ontario, who had political dreams. During his reading, Elizabeth told MacDonald that he would become the leader of a new country. The location of the capital of that new country would be chosen by Queen Victoria herself. It would be in a location that there were two cities divided by a river. The Queen would choose the city on the south side of the river to be the political centre of the country. The city would form at the location of what was then a rough lumber town called Bytown. Several years later, in 1867, the Dominion of Canada was formed, with Sir John A. Macdonald being the country's first Prime Minister. The old lumber town of Bytown that Elizabeth talked about grew into the capital city of Canada, which today is called Ottawa. This city is located on the south side of the Ottawa River, and on the other side is a city called Gatineau, which is in the province of Quebec. Where the Canadian Parliament building sit today is in an area that was named for the old town that used to be at that location, Bytown. Now personally, I think that Mother Barnes earned her quarter for that reading. Now for our last story today, I thought I would tell you guys a bit about Sir John A. Macdonald's legacy. Now, this man was born in Scotland on either January 10th or 11th in 1815, and as a young boy, he and his family immigrated to Kingston, Ontario, which at that time was called Upper Canada. As we mentioned in our last story, he became a lawyer, which helped him gain prominence. Now, this helped him to get elected in 1844 to the legislature of what was then called the Province of Canada. He soon became the premier, and then in 1864, he agreed to a proposal from his political rival to join forces since at the time no party proved capable to hold power for very long. 
When the parties joined, they moved forward towards federation. Then on July 1, 1867, Canada became a country with its first leader being Macdonald. But Macdonald wasn't necessarily a great guy. He was instrumental in creating genocide against the Canadian Indigenous population through his policies of land claims and by creating residential schools. These had the main goal to separate Indigenous children from their loved ones and forbid them to acknowledge their heritage or speak their own languages under the guise of education. These schools wanted to indoctrinate these children into what they said was the Christian way of life through severe punishment and physical, sexual, emotional, and psychological abuse. Many children died from this abuse through disease and through lack of care. Now on top of all this, MacDonald was a British imperialist and a racist that pushed policy that matched his anti-Indigenous, anti-Métis, anti-French, anti-Irish, and anti-Chinese attitudes. Now, for years, people pushed to get monuments to this man to be taken down. Now, one of these monuments was erected on June 6, 1895, in a former cemetery in Montreal, Quebec. Now, this cemetery has its own very interesting past. It used to be called St. Antoine Cemetery, and it's located in the heart of downtown Montreal. Today, this area contains two very popular parks called Dorchester Square and Place du Canada, but under these parks is hidden a deep, dark secret. Just below where people go to enjoy the outdoors and maybe have a picnic are the bodies of about 70,000 people. Many of these were victims of cholera and were buried in mass graves during the cholera epidemics in the mid-1800s. It operated as a Catholic cemetery from 1799 to 1855 until they ran out of space. So what did the city do? Well, they knocked the graves over, put some topsoil over them, made some parks and more space for buildings. It is said that this location has constant paranormal activity and perhaps maybe it's because how the people were treated in death. Now, during these times, the epidemic became so bad that death carts would roam the streets with yellow flags flying to make sure people were aware that those inside could be contagious. They would be pulled by grave diggers who would yell out like street vendors asking for the dead. They would collect the bodies and put them in rough-looking coffins and cart them down to St. Antoine Cemetery where the bodies would be piled up in stacks. They didn't separate the men, women, or children. They didn't keep records. The goal was to get the bodies in the ground in less than six hours to prevent the spread of infection. Soon, there were just too many bodies to meet that mandate. This is where the local priests took over. They ordered their flocks to come to the cemetery with shovels, dig trenches that were eight feet deep, ten feet wide, and a hundred feet long. The bodies would then be stacked in the crude coffins into the trenches and quickly covered with soil to help stop the disease. To make this even faster, coffins were just stacked up on top of each other within the trenches. With this type of history, should anyone be surprised that there's constant paranormal activity at this site? People constantly report seeing orbs and spirits of the dead walking through this area, and often hear someone unseen saying prayers. But what does this have to do with Sir John A. Macdonald? Well, in the Place du Canada Park, until very recently, stood a statue of MacDonald. It was erected on June 6, 1895, in the old cemetery itself. It stood in place for 125 years until it was torn down by anti-genocide activists on August 29, 2020. It is said that an above-average number of medical emergencies occur near to where this statue stood. Many people used to say that the statue itself was haunted, with its bronze eyes following people as they would pass. Many reported feeling evil entities near the statue, and now that it's torn down, its activity actually massively increased at the space it stood. To erect this statue, workers had to dig up bodies to place the foundation. These bodies were of the people that MacDonald hated, the French, the Indigenous, the Métis people, and the Irish. Now, considering the fact that politicians decided to install a Protestant symbol of British imperialism and genocide in a former Catholic burial ground upset not just the living, but it upset the dead too. 
rumors immediately began circulating that this cemetery desecration would result in this area being haunted by the spirits whose bodies were displaced just for MacDonald. When the statue was unveiled, over 300 armed soldiers were in attendance to attempt to quiet protesters. But that didn't work, so instead, authorities ordered the marching band who was there that day to play as loud as possible to try to drown them out. As the years passed, many avoided the monument due to the negativity it represented. But that didn't stop the tales of people seeing the ghosts of those displaced wandering around that statue. And then came the medical emergencies. People started suffering from panic attacks, strokes, and heart attacks when they were nearby. And then came the worst tale. It is said that this evil statue had the power to possess or brainwash the people nearby. These people were said to immediately adopt imperialist, racist, and genocidal behaviors if they were near the statue for too long. Now, when the statue was torn down in 2020, many were overjoyed to see the force of the landing decapitated McDonald's head. But this act even started another rumor. After this event, the Quebec Premier and the Montreal Mayor denounced this act, and they vowed to restore the statue. Many now say they did so because the haunted statue twisted their minds like it supposedly did so many others. But since then, locals have noticed a sharp increase of activity around this location. Many now report seeing ghostly figures dancing on the place where the statue once stood. Perhaps the spirits are now happy that their former oppressor is no longer being celebrated. Thank you all for joining me for our latest episode of Horrifying History. Join us on Facebook at Horrifying History, on Instagram at Horrifying underscore History, on Twitter at Horrifying H-I-S-T-1, or reach out to us by email at HorrifyingHistory at Outlook.com to join supernatural history junkies like me to discuss all the ghost stories from where you live. Now, if you haven't done it yet, please remember to hit the subscribe button for this podcast. When you do, not only do you let more people know about this show, but you download our next episode on its day of release. It's a great way not to miss our next episode, The Exorcism of Anna Eklund. Also, if you would like to bring home a piece of horrifying history, you need to check out our store. You'll find some great spooky items by going to redbubble.com and searching for horrifying history in their search box. Thank you all for listening again today, and until next time...